want to take you on a journey. And this journey will start in one isolated and stunning place in South America. It's a very quiet place. Nobody is living there, not even a single spider or snake. There's no sound around you. The landscape reminds you a bit of the surface of a different planet. And when you are there, you don't wonder why NASA is testing the vehicles there that later go and do their job on Mars. There are two valleys. One is called Mars Valley, and one is called Moon Valley. And as so far away from there, there's Chaknantor Plateau, where there is one amazing observatory in 5,000 meter altitude. The place is called Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on this planet. And this is Alma. If you translate it from Spanish, you would say it's soul. Greeks would say it's jump. But scientists say it's Atacama Large Millimeter Array, big radio telescope, 64 antennas that work together as one big radio telescope, 16 kilometer big radio telescope. And when I was there, I was wondering why people want to build this expensive device there in such a remote area, because it's very hard to live there, to walk there, to work there. Because if you walk as you do usually, it's already way too fast because of the altitude and lack of oxygen. You can have headaches and you feel dizzy. But of course, the official answer is because of the night sky. The night sky in Atacama is very dark. It's very good for astronomical observation, no big cities around. And of course, the dry side is very good for astronomical observation on its own. But when I was there equipped with an oxygen mask, these answers for me were not enough. I was still asking why people want to do this science here, where it's so hard to do it. And I think the real answer is the desire to answer the classical questions that people ask already thousands of years. Where do we come from? Are we alone? Is there anybody else? But have you asked yourself why people want to ask these questions? And why all this so long time we can't come up with an answer? And isn't it interesting that scientists and also people who say they don't believe in science, they both are searching this answer in the sky? I think here we come to the most amazing and saddest story at the same time, to the point what science is about. We think that we can know a lot, and we can know a lot. But we know that there is some limit. We can't know everything. So how to talk about this, I don't know, because in science, answer I don't know is really a good answer. When I started my broadcast almost 10 years ago, I chose the name for my broadcast, The Known Within the Unknown. And then I understood if I want that people will listen to my program, they need to understand what I'm talking about. And if everybody needs to understand, of course, it should be really related to everyone, right? So I started to search connections. Connections between complicated science performed in science centers somewhere far away, and simple tasks performed in our everyday life, let's say using the same Wi-Fi technology. It's in our lives thanks to radio astronomy. I started to search connections between animals that lived on this planet millions and millions of years ago, and they still have their footprints here. And scientists, as a sophisticated detectives, can search from these footprints how they looked like, what they were eating, and they even know how and when they disappeared, way before humans came to this planet. I searched connections between our plastic shopping bag and fish dying in the ocean, because this bag becomes trash and kills the animals under the water, and this trash already forms islands in the Pacific. I started to search connections between everyone and everything. When was the last time you had a blood test? Do you know how much iron you have in your blood or how old it is? Well, scientists say it's 8 billion years old. Because that time, one big old star exploded. And since then, we have elements like carbon, calcium, iron in the universe and also in our blood. And this stardust still connects us to each other, to the universe and to the each life form on this planet. One more question. Do you know what it's like when you want to cry, but you can't? And not just because tears don't come to your eyes. Because they stay there as a bubble, and they don't roll down your cheek, and they just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, if you haven't been to space, or you at least haven't cried on a zero-gravity plane, you don't know what it's like, and you haven't experienced this. But there are people who have, and from their experience, astronauts who told me about this, 
I use this example to explain complicated things. For example, in this case, how gravity works. And here I come to the point that talking about science is searching the common language. Common language between people who think about the same things, they just call them differently, they label them differently. People who know a lot and people who hear something for the first time. But I need to create feeling for them, that they are well enough informed to understand the complicated things I'm going to talk about, and they don't want to switch off my broadcast after second sentence. I search a common language between me and scientists. Of course, I need to understand what scientist is telling to me and how you have heard, probably, it's quite hard to understand the scientists. Well, my recipe is to answer two simple questions. What and why? And if I get the answers from scientists' interview on these questions, I have feeling that I understand exactly what he wants to tell me, and I'm ready to build my story to share it with my audience. But why it's so hard to understand scientists? My version is because they know more foreign languages than we do. Let's say biologists. Biologists understand language of chemical signals, because this is the language that cells use when they communicate to each other. Every single moment, right now when I'm on the stage, billions of messages have been sent under my skin, because this is the way how cells communicate to each other. And as a journalist, I don't need to know this language to explain you how it works. I need to find just one scientist who can tell me this. And scientists definitely could put on his CV probably one more foreign language than I do, the language of chemical signals. The same astronauts do, and astronomers mostly. They translate as language of light in our words. From spectrum, they can read what chemical elements, let's say, comet has, and comet is hundreds of million kilometers far away from us. They can show us, for example, this uh, place, and this place is where many stars are born. And we would be able to see this place only if we would be able to see the heat. This is the famous Saturn with a ring, and maybe tonight we would be able to see this ring if our vision would be a thousand more sharper than it is. So talking about science is talking about choosing the correct wavelength. And choosing the correct wavelength, I think it's uh, talking about complicated things and using the simple examples. And I would just make an experiment now. Let's say that this is something I want to talk to you now, and you are my listeners on radio. It's a very important formula. It's something that changed our way of thinking already a long time ago. And it's something that's really worth talking. Would you be interested to listen about this today? I yes. quite doubt it. Maybe a few. <laughs> Maybe a few. <laughs> because it's kind of interesting way, in few symbols, you can tell really big science truth. <laughs> Let's call it like this. But if I would tell you that these few characters explain you why moon is not falling on our head, would it sound more interesting for you for today? I would prove, and I would check the second version. So talking about science and searching these simple examples means also sometimes searching them in nature. At least my version is like this. And we all know that there are things in nature that are too slow or too fast to be caught by our physical eyes. And to explain you this, I want to show you one video. Uh, let's say how plant is growing. When we observe it daily, we see just the result, how it's changing day by day, and maybe just a few millimeters. But with the special cameras, we can film it, and then we can show you everything that happened in a few months, in 30 seconds. And you can see that plant is changing all the time. It's growing constantly. The same is happening with things that are too fast to be caught by our eyes. Let's say mosquito flight or dragonfly flight technique. Mostly, we just hear them passing near us. But with the cameras like this, what you just saw with this plant, we can film this process, we can show it, and we can see that they move their four wings in different dimensions at the same time. They know even how to fly backwards. And we just try to now build the devices that do the same. So what I want to say is that until this camera wasn't built, we couldn't see this. We couldn't maybe know this. And I think something similar is happening to our conscious as well. There are things we can't know, we can't explain, we can't see, let's say, see with our conscious. 
And I think we, we really want to have a device that will show us everything that is unknown for us. And many times we ask from science to become this device, to show us this. But science can't explain everything. Science is something that can tell you things that you can measure, where you can make an experiment, where you can compare the results. But how we all know, we learn also from our experience. And sometimes our experience is something that you can't measure, and you can't make an experiment, and you can't do it again. Uh, there's one scientist um, who is often my guest in my radio broadcast, and he said like science is like taking a fishing net and going to the lake to catch fish. And of course, this fishing net can have big holes and small holes. And with the big holes, you will never catch the smallest fish. But will you say that there is not small fish at all in this lake? No, you just can't know this. But if you tasted the small fish on your plate, probably you, you don't care if someone says there is no small fish at all because we didn't see it in the net. In these 10 years, when I was hosting and producing my radio broadcast about science, of course, I met many interesting people with different experiences. Because I talk about astronomy, about biology, about chemistry, about physics, about history, about very, very different things. I talked to astronauts who had experience to walk in space. He was telling me how it is to do these steps there and how our planet looked from above. I talked also to the inventor who had crazy idea that plane can fly without a single gram of fuel. And now this plane already landed in many international airports. And I talked to the woman who experienced clinical death. And that was the case when I didn't know how exactly to talk about it, because it's something that I can't measure. I can't prove what is that what he's telling me, how it was to be dead. I can't ask her to do it again for me. And I can't ask someone to say, is she lying or no? So here I come to the point that talking about science and asking questions about these known and unknown things, this edge between known and unknown, and in general thinking about these known and unknown things, is doing it with responsibility, with curiosity, and respect at the same time. So when I found my language, how to talk about science with scientists, I thought maybe it's interesting to ask scientists if it's interesting and easy to talk to me. And there's one physicist who always leaves my broadcast saying that it's so amazing, it's so easy, it, I'm so inspired now and in such a good mood. So I went to see him and I said, look, I have one scientific question to you, why it is easy to talk to me? And he said, well, the scientific method I can't tell you, because then I need one more myself and one more you, Sandra, sitting and having coffee, and I need to have the same experience in life, and then I can compare them. But I can tell you from my point of view. And he said, it's easy because you don't know the borders. And I was, what? What kind of borders? You mean what exactly you want to say? And he explained me that there is one truth always and other truth. And of course, people believe in their truth, and they fight for their truth. And always, when two opinions meet, they create a front line. But if you fight on one side more, or the other answers more, and the front line becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you are so busy with fighting techniques and guns and protection plans that you just don't have time to research your truth more. And he said, when you talk to me, I have a feeling that you don't know this border exists because you don't ask me about fighting techniques or guns. You directly ask me about an idea that doesn't belong to anybody. And for me, that was the confirmation that my strategy of what and why probably works. Well, at the beginning, I told you that we are traveling today, and we started our journey in the Atacama Desert. Now, to see strange structures, you don't need to climb 5,000 meters high. You need to go 1,000 meters deep underground. You need to take an old box-type elevator that fits 15 people, yourself and 14 miners. Six minutes, you won't see anything, just complete darkness around you and big noise that will go in through your airplugs. And after these six minutes, you'll reach 1,000 meter underground. Miners will go on the left. You will take the narrow tunnels on the right, and you will see salt around you. 200 million years old salt. Welcome to the Bulby mine in the UK. But you didn't come here because of the salt. You came because here is the, one of the few deep underground laboratories in the world. And you won't believe that people explore here. Yes, the universe. 
They want to catch the small particles that comes from far away because of the natural radiation that is reduced in this place until the minimum. It's a quiet place, they can make research there. But when I was there underground, I was still asking this question, why people want to sit under this one kilometer thick rock layer and hope that maybe one day they won't have fire in these narrow tunnels that looks like this. And just to catch the particles, just to answer the question, and maybe one day to catch these particles, to say what is that dark matter that forms more than 95% of our universe? I think this why is very connected to the why I asked in ALMA. It's again being connected to everyone, to each other, to the universe, to the big unknown. That is not lack of knowledge, but it's part of knowledge. And I would say that this big unknown is a fuel that drives us further to learn more, to ask more, just to be alive. And as people in Bowlby mind, they want fresh air, they need fresh air. Mankind as well needs fresh air that drives us further and keeps us searching for the creative answers to this constantly changing I don't knows. And this is the man that inspires me already since childhood, Jacques Cousteau. I always say that he showed us one more planet on this planet. He showed what is under the water. And he showed us that it's nothing empty, dark, silent. It's full of life. Different, but still life of this planet. And a long time I was afraid of this underwater world, and I had opportunity to interview his son, and thanks to him I overcame my fear, and now, I, instead of being afraid of diving, I really love diving, and I discovered this world for myself. But Jacques-Yves Cousteau, he asked the question, what is a scientist? And his answer was, scientist is a curious man who is sitting and looking through the keyhole of nature, trying to guess what's going on. And I would say that science journalist is that lucky person who can sit next to him and all the time can ask, what is that what he sees? Thank you.